So we save the best for last. This is a topic that neither of us are comfortable talking about. And it took me five years just to say the word sex publicly and a lot of therapy. So um, for this one, we've chosen the term, the, the class, the red zone. If you understand anything about football, you know what the red zone is? It's the last 20 yards of the field, but once you get in that 20 yards, you're gonna score. So see the, see it's, a, a, it's an analogy. It's a, it's a metaphor for scoring. See, do I need to bring this one home any? All right, I think you got it. All right, we even got a new clicker going here. Bing. Oh. Oh, no, you're not gonna do this, are you? Oh, wait, 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 it's off. I've turned the on thing. No one told me that. There we go. All right. No, uh, there we go, thank you. Christy said not to mention her name. She does all our tech, because it's on a recording, and it'll be in this recording for eternity, so I'm not gonna say that was all Christy's fault. That just happened, so. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. She, she's awesome, doing a great job. Just kidding. Um, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all, honored, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral, not sexually immortal, okay, in case you misread that. So let's start out this talk about sex with something that's inarguably true that it says in the Bible. It's because um, sex in the context of a marital relationship is important. It's not the whole ball of wax, it's not the number one thing, but it's definitely very important. Hebrews 13, four says that marriage should be honored by all, marriage bed kept pure. Sex and marriage, it's what differentiates our relationship with each other from our relationship with anyone else, hopefully, in theory. You know what I'm saying? See, this is a landmine of double entendres, so it's hard to say anything during this talk without it being a, oh, I get you, wink, wink. Okay, face value here. Um, the whole book of Song of Songs is about that, tells us about intimacy that's in marriage. It's not Song of Songs, Song of Songs isn't the, you know, people have tried to bend that into something else that it's not. It's really a metaphor for this or that, no. It's so specific when you read it, it's about sexual intimacy in marriage and how, what it's meant to be and how great it is. You know, I've been reading this book about biblical translation. You ever read Song of Solomon and you get to that part, my sister, my bride, and did you go, ew? Because I have two sisters. I can't unthink that, you know? I mean, so I looked it up. The reason it says my sister is there's no English equivalent to that word that they use in, in that psalm. It's more like what we would call soulmate. It's a word that has no direct correlate in English. It's something deeper than my bride, my soulmate. So as Mary often explains to her teenage patients who are at risk for having sexual encounters out of marriage, sex isn't just a physical thing, it's an everything thing. It's an emotional thing, it's a physical thing, it's a mental thing, it's a spiritual thing as well. It's meant to be pure, it's meant to be exclusive. It's supposed to differentiate, like I said, our relationships from that of any other relationship um, in the world. That's why there's so many scriptures against sexual immorality. And if you look at all the, you know, Ephesians, all the scriptures with bad things listed, sexual immorality is usually up towards the top because it's so prevalent and we're so susceptible to it. And there's really not a whole lot of arguing in the Bible when it says those words, what it's talking about. It's talking about sex outside of marriage. Um, and Paul said, when you unite yourself with a prostitute, you become one flesh. It's an act that's supposed to make you become one flesh. So you don't do it just casually. You don't give it away casually. It's meant to bond us in marriage. Um, now what? Uh, the next slide, please. She's getting back at me, isn't she? All right. This is the ideal that I'm going to turn it over to Mary to talk about. 
You know, Michael and I have spent a lot of time talking about this one flesh concept, and it's obviously talking about a sexual relationship in marriage, but it's so much more than that. You know, when you are married, whatever happens to your partner happens to you, you know? If your spouse loses their job, you've lost a job, right? You know, Michael got diagnosed with cancer this summer. Guess who had cancer? We both had cancer. We both had to deal with cancer. So it's so much more. It is sexuality, but it's so much more. Whatever happens to my spouse happens to me as well. Um, Let's look at one more scripture. We'll go to the next slide. In 1 Corinthians 7, it says, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for man not to marry. Too late, everybody. Too late, all right? (laughs) But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know, obviously the scripture sets up an expectation for sexuality and marriage to be an ongoing, regular, positive event for both partners. For both partners. It's designed for both partners. It's meant to keep them from being tempted with sexual immorality. And it's also meant to, to deepen the relationship and strengthen the relationship. Um, The word duty there is actually two Greek words that might be better translated the good or kindness that is owed. So it is a good or kindness that we owe our spouse, all right? Not duty in the the kind of, you know, we think of it as, you know, yeah, it's not like that, all right? But it's it's a kindness, it's a good that we give to each other. Um... You know, each, and and the other thing to notice here is each partner has the same rights and the same responsibility, you know? You know, this this scripture doesn't say your body doesn't belong to you. It says it does, but it also belongs to your spouse and vice versa. That's for both men and women. Um, The concept, again, the concept of authority in this scripture having authority over is more what we would call stewardship. You know, I think of Michael mentioned Downton Abbey, and I'm a huge Downton Abbey fan, but you think of the big house in Downton Abbey and the head butler or house guy, whatever he was, he was the steward of the estate, right? He didn't own it, but he wanted things to go great for that place. And every decision he made was to build up the, that home, that estate, and to do what was best for that estate. That's stewardship, you know. That's the concept that they're talking about when they talk about having authority here in this scripture. You know, if you think, if you, and I think this changes our thinking a little bit. If we think of ourselves as stewards of our spouse's sexual life, you know, we're going to do things a little bit differently, right? Right? You know, there, there's, a, there's a responsibility there that I have stewardship over making sure that my spouse is sexually fulfilled and sexually happy and sexually safe. Um, and, and I think we have to retrain ourselves to think like this. You want to do what's best for the other person, and you want the other person thinking about what's doing best for you as well. Now, as if you needed any convincing, Um, Did you know there are health benefits to sex? Yeah, it's good for your health. You're like, yeah, and? Um, So what are these alleged health benefits, Mike? Well, blood pressure, reactivity to stress goes down and people are having sex regularly. So regular sex will keep you from killing your kids. (laughs) Is that whole point. You're less reactive. Your blood pressure is more stable. When you get upset, it doesn't spike when you're having sex regularly. Um, A reduced risk of cancer. Some types of cancer in both genders, prostate in men and cervical cancer in women. So less likely to have two types of cancer 
If you have sex regularly, okay, that's good. Do uh, you have anything else? Sure, why not? <laughs> Sexual intercourse correlates with greater satisfaction with life in general and satisfaction with the relationship and improved mental health. Um, thank goodness, because Mary and I only have so many tools available to us to help your mental health. It would be great if y'all could throw in a little bit. So <laughs> this is a great way to do it. Now, what about, so there's the health benefits. Let's talk about statistics. And there's a reason I'm gonna do this. What, you're breaking sex down into numbers? Well, listen, this is important. But we're gonna sexualize it by going bow, chicka, bow, bow. These are some sex statistics. That makes it more interesting. Now, in the past, if you've been doing this for more than 10 minutes as a Christian, you've gone to some married retreats before, right? Way back in the day, back in the old days, there was only one thing that was used to gauge your sexual life as, as married couple, and that's frequency. So what would happen is we'd go to these married retreats and we'd touch on the issue of frequency, and if you weren't sufficiently frequent, you were challenged to go up to your room at the end of the day and we'll see you tomorrow. And you'd, and you'd better do this because your discipling partner's gonna check and see you know exactly what happened. Um, I always hated that. I mean, I love the assignment, but I hated that because, and this is super important, frequency for its own sake is a mistake, all right? Everyone's concerned about how often, how many times. Frequency as its own end is a big mistake. This isn't a competition, okay? We're not in a competition. However, frequency is a function of desire. Desire fuels a sexual relationship. So there's gotta be a, a, a rhythm to frequency because it's a function of desire. So there's gotta be some level of frequency in preparing this talk, I found a lot of research that says sexual problems in the world have to do with differences in expectations about what is good sex. Everyone builds things up a little too much and it causes problems, right? So I just wanna share some statistics to show you what's considered normal desire between couples in the world, not Christian couples. One in five married couples in the world has a non-sexual marriage which is defined as less than 10 sexual encounters a year. Some of you guys out there are like, Phew, thank goodness for last night. <laughs> Check off that <laughs> number 11 <laughs> just in time, right? <laughs> One in five, so that's quite a bit. Um, the initial romantic love um, phase, you know, when you can't keep your hands off each other, that only goes, that usually lasts for less than two years and often less than six months, six months, and then the thrill is gone after six months for some people. That's scary. The average frequency of intercourse is from four times per week to once every two weeks, but it, it's stratified by age. For couples in their 20s, it's two to three times a week. For couples in their 50s, it's one to two times a week. For me, it's all how much Geritol we have on hand. Um, <laughs> You know, have I had a cup of coffee? Can, you know. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Is it to discourage you? No. The reason I'm saying it is that there's no standard, okay? There's no acceptable standard of what's frequent enough beyond what you as a couple decide. I'm trying to take the pressure off of you to attain some average rate frequency of sex because once again, for its own sake, it's meaningless. It only sets you up for failure. Now, that having been said, when sex is too infrequent, what happens is when it's gonna happen, there's way too much expectation built up there, right? So it's like, oh, this is the night it's gonna happen. And then there's all this, you know, it's gotta be perfect and we both gotta have a mountaintop experience and then, you know, then you're paralyzed maybe by anxiety or pressure or whatever. So it's not like, you know, a work performance evaluation you get at work. You know, when you know your boss is gonna be sitting in on your, you know, what you're doing, and you get all nervous and, you know, it shouldn't be like that, if that makes sense. So if you're doing it frequently enough, which again is up to y'all, 
even when someone has to say no, or even when it's not a skyrocket experience, you can say fine. It's not the end of our marriage. It's not, it's just a, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. If, you, if you build this up too much, it's gonna be paralysis. If you put too much into it, into frequency, you're just setting yourself up for failure. It shouldn't be that way. This should be a thing you're very, not casual about, but you're not all uptight about and you don't set certain standards or goals like that. However, that having been said, <laughs> in the world, here's some more statistics. 35 to 40 percent, this is kind of funny, of experiences are rated as very good for both people. 35 to 40. By my calculations, that means 60 to 65 percent are something else. All right? So that's okay. I hope you're seeing that and you're going, oh, thank goodness. Because, you know, every time things don't work out, I, you know, I'm disappointed in myself and I feel guilty. And, you know, it shouldn't be that way. This is kind of a, a this is a historical, um, this is statistic here. Don't shoot the messenger. 20% of encounters are very good for one. I'll give you two guesses. Which one? But you're only going to need one guess. Um, and only okay for the other. Something we can work on. 15 to 20% are okay for one and meh for the other. That's meant to show acceptable. And 5 to 15%, which is fairly significant if you think about it in raw numbers, are dissatisfying or dysfunctional for both, which means you say, okay, this is not going to happen today. What are we watching on TV? And that is totally okay. Now, why am I telling you this? Because on one hand, I want you to have realistic expectations, okay? You see these numbers? It doesn't have to be a mountaintop experience every time. It does 35 to 40% of the time. No, no, no. It doesn't have to be a mountaintop experience every time. It's totally dependent on you as a couple. Um, every time, I mean, it can be a hilltop experience. It can be a molehill experience, and that's fine. You can have an occasional, even mediocre experience. As long as you accept it without guilt or without blame, and you're willing to try again later. Man, was I relieved to find that out when I was a young Christian. You see what I'm saying? Frequency for frequency's sake is bad. You come up with a rhythm that's acceptable to both of you. It doesn't have to be perfect all the time, as long as both are comfortable and safe. Um, yeah, I think that's explanatory. On the other hand, as a Christian couple, you don't have to accept these mediocre statistics of the world. In fact, here's another statistic. I read a thing according to the National Institutes of Health. The level of emotional and physical satisfaction with sex is highest for people who attend church regularly. Doesn't even matter what kind of church, just if you go regularly and lowest for unmarried people with no religious affiliations. And you may be thinking, well, if they're unmarried, why are they having sex? Think about that one for a second. There's plenty of people living together having sex who aren't married, or not even living together and having sex. They actually have the lowest level of um, satisfaction in their sexual life. And people without any faith base have the lowest level. So, so, this is propaganda that's fed to you by media, by television shows that make it look like every time you have wild, unemotional sex with a stranger, the more you can do that, the happier you're gonna be. The statistics don't bear that out. The statistics say, if you're religiously committed and have faith, you're rewarded by God with a better sex life. So you should give yourself a break for every occasional missed opportunity and God's still gonna award you for giving it the old college try. Um, and Mary's going to talk about some things that disrupt sex. Um, you know, if God, in Genesis 2, God gave us the sexual relationship between a husband and wife as a gift. So, of course, in Genesis 3, that's the first thing Satan messes up, right? You know, I think it's interesting. The first consequence of Adam and Eve's sin is they became embarrassed of their bodies, and so Satan took away this, the purity and the innocence in their sexual relationship. 
And guess what? Satan's still trying to figure out how to ruin it for us today. Um, you know, one of the things that can disrupt sex for a couple is your past. Um, you know, ideally, we would come into marriage from homes that were loving and supportive and gave us a healthy spiritual view of sexuality, ideally. Unfortunately, most of us did not come into marriage with that past, right? I mean, we just didn't. Um, so some of the things that we experienced growing up in, in our past and in our thinking are gonna affect us sexually. You know, at the worst extreme are things like being exposed to sexual abuse. Um, the statistics are, the current research indicates that one in three women and somewhere between one in four out of seven men experienced some form of sexual abuse as a child. That's pretty horrific, all right? Um, and obviously, that's gonna affect you coming into your marriage. Now, you can heal from sexual abuse. You can heal from it, but it takes some work. And this is an area where, you know, we've been talking about being a team all day long. This is an area where you gotta be a team, all right? It's not his problem or her problem. It's our problem. It's our problem. We've got to figure out how to help with this. We've got to figure out how to solve this as a couple. You know, so you've got to talk to each other. There's got, there's got to be a lot of communication. You may need, need to get professional help. That is fine. That's what they're there for, all right? That's what people went to school for all those years for. If you need that, get that, you know. But don't let it be something that ruins this precious gift that God has given you just because somebody else sinned against you when you were a child. Um, you know, you may have been raised in, in a home where sexuality was either repressed or totally ignored or just seen as a sin, period. You know, um, like I said, I was raised with good parents, good parents, but very conservative parents, very strict parents. There were three girls in my house. So you can imagine the, the communication about sexuality in my house was about that much, all right? And then I went to 12 years of Catholic school with nuns, all right? And didn't get a whole lot of help there either, all right? <laughs> so I had, to, you know, I had to, when we became disciples, this is an area I had to work on, you know, because I didn't have a great view, nothing, I had no abuse or anything like that. I had just never been taught anything about it. It was never talked about, ever. You know, so this is something that I had to kind of go through the scriptures and go, okay, this is something God wants us to have as a married couple, and it's supposed to be good. It's supposed to be a good thing. Um, you know, regardless of what you've experienced in your past, we all have, and I think we all have to an extent that we don't even understand, been infected by our culture's view of sexuality you know, what I like to call Hollywood sex, all right? It's what Michael was just talking about. You know, you turn on a movie or you turn on the TV, the perfect sexual encounter is usually two people who barely know each other, right? It often involves adultery. You know, at the very best scenario, they're 20 years old, they're 10 pounds underweight, and their bodies have been airbrushed, all right? <laughs> I mean, this does not help us out, folks, all right? To think that that is normal sexuality or that is ideal sexuality, all right? This does not help us out. This is, you know, anyway, we've got to, we've got to get rid of this cultural idea of what good sex is and get back to what God says good sex is, all right? You're up. I'm going to pick up one of these points and then hand it right back to Mary, but I, I think I was more comfortable talking about this. Another thing that hurts our sexual relationships is our own past sins. Now, there are the obvious ones, like things we did before we were married, maybe even things we did when we were married before we were Christians. Those are the obvious ones. Um, but once again, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Mary and I are hearing more and more from couples about the damaging effects of pornography. I saw a patient, um, actually I was seeing his wife, who was all full of resentment about this guy, who considered pornography a victimless crime. 
He, you know, he wasn't fooling around with anybody. He was, but he was paying. He had a monthly subscription and, you know, obviously was having a severe impact on their relationship sexually, but he saw it as victimless. Why would that, you know, if anything, it gives me ideas, you know? What? No, it doesn't work that way. So know that pornography is damaging to everyone that touches it. If you think it's victimless, not only is it hurting your marriage, but you're promoting other you know, criminal behaviors and who knows what else, exploitation. Um, uh, our youngest kid is the senior manager of all the emergency services for the homeless in Seattle, downtown Seattle, and she talks about sex trafficking. This is her big, you know, one of her big campaigns. So you're promoting all, if you indulge in pornography, not only are you wrecking your marriage, you're promoting a lot of evil in the world. So please, if this is a problem for you, you know, your spouse is only going to feel betrayed, disgusted, no argument is going to hurt, fix that hurt. So keep your marriage pure from this sin. Now, if you have a problem with pornography, get help. A lot of churches these days, God bless them, have um, men's groups for dealing with that. And I praise these men for being open enough to admit that they have a problem and humble enough to seek help for it. And they draw a lot of strength from each other in these groups. We have one in the Triangle Church in North Carolina. God bless them and the efforts they put in to protecting their marriage. If you don't have a group like that in your church, go get help in the world. You know, they have excellent... The AA model, um, you know why it's endured for so long in treating alcoholism? is because it works. It works. It works on mutual accountability, admitting that there's a power higher than you are, and admitting that you can't fix your own problem. That's the basic premise of AA. And there are similar groups for um, pornography addiction. So that's all I'm going to say about that. If you struggle with that particular sin, please seek help. It's not a victimless crime. Um, the next one, I think, is more, more specific to women, but maybe not. But how about if you have resentments or bitterness towards your husband? And is that, is that infecting your sexual relationship? Um, you know, I think, I think for men in general, they can resent the heck out of you and still go, let's go to bed, all right? <laughs> But with women, it's different, right? With women, it's different. If, we're, if we are dealing with resentments and bitterness, then a, a romantic evening is out of the question for us. If there's a disturbance in the force, it's not gonna happen, all right? Um, you know, one of the assignments I used to get when I saw, when I saw sisters in private practice, and sometimes I would get with a sister and it would start coming out. You know, the years of this, he did this and he did that and he did this. And, um, and, and the resentments were obvious there, you know. And I would give the very unbiblical assignment of you get a notebook and you write on the top of it, my record of wrongs. Because we're told we're not supposed to have them, right? But man, if you sit down and it starts pouring out in the first 15 minutes, they're there. So let's at least get them on paper. So I want you to write down when you think of something that you're upset with or you resent your husband for, write it down and we're gonna talk about it and you're gonna to talk to your husband about it and you're gonna to talk to other people about it and you're gonna pray about it until you can draw a line through that. And then we'll move to the next one on your record of wrongs. You know. So if you have a record of wrongs, get to work on it. All right? The resentment is your sin. That's your sin. Not what was done against you, but the, you holding those resentments. So those can be cleaned out, but you gotta, you gotta do some work on those. So, um, you know, plain old selfishness can disrupt our sex lives, right? I've got my schedule. I'm not gonna change my schedule. I'm not, we're go to bed at two different times. We've always done that because you get sleepy early and I wanna stay up and watch something on TV. Just being selfish can disrupt our sex lives. You know, we've gotta kill some of that, all right? Again, if you go back to, you know, what Michael was talking about with the solving circle, we've gotta, we've almost gotta think about our marriages as being a third person that's more important than either one of us, you know? So what's going to be good for the marriage? You know, maybe I can stay up 30 minutes later. Maybe. Not tonight, but maybe. <laughs> you know, maybe you can skip your favorite program tonight. 
you know, maybe, maybe you can do that. So just dealing with selfishness uh, in ourselves. You know, the last thing that Satan can use to disrupt sex is just daily life. Does anybody have a new baby in the house? Anybody? Some, some people are about to have new babies in the house. Yeah, that'll do it, right? Yeah, do the, do the colic at 3 a.m. That's sex is, you know, no, all right? Okay, even worse, get a house full of teenagers because they actually know what you're doing when you go to the bedroom and close the door. You know, good luck with that, all right? Yeah, so we gotta, all I'm saying is we've gotta make this a priority. We've gotta make it a priority. Um. <laughs> the teenager thing. Um, there's one. No, no, too late now. Too late now. <laughs> I'm just going to say there was one time where um, our kids were supposed to be out and doing a teen activity with church. Um, and let's just say they didn't call before coming home and were. Uh, treated to a very unique experience um, that to this day they don't let us forget they, they, they say you know and it was the whole teen ministry it wasn't just our kids it was everyone walking in so yeah to this day you know it's like mom and dad we can't no amount of therapy or lobotomy will take that memory out of our you know, we've tried hypnosis, we've tried nothing, you know. So I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying, choose your times wisely. Um, looking at the median age of this group, we can go no further without talking about the effects of aging and sexuality. Now, if you're a newlywed, I don't care. You stay right here, because this is gonna happen to you someday. <laughs> Plus, I talked to a brother who's been married a year, and he's 57. So there's no, yeah, there's, this is going to happen, so you might as well pay attention. This is aging, in a nutshell, right there. Um, basically, that's what happens. Um, as you age, things rust, things fall off. Some things get hairier, some things get less hairy. Some things get closer to the ground. Some things uh, get heavier. Some things get more rigid. Unfortunately, it's usually your joints or your bowels, not the things we want to get rid of. Some things become more flaccid, like, okay, well, you, you get it. Now, are there things you can do to mitigate the effects of aging? Absolutely, yes. Call us back for another time. We'll do a whole well-being, the benefits of exercise and diet and self-care, okay? You can mitigate the effects of aging just by exercising regularly, watching what you eat, and having no, um, novel mental activity, keeping your mind busy. Even if you do that, it's going to happen. <laughs> Getting closer. You know the, you know the movie um, uh, Gladiator, where Maximus says, "Sometimes death smiles you in the at you, and all you can do is smile back at him." You know that's what's going to happen. Going to be catching up with us uh, at some point. Um, I was until getting a cancer on my face and a, a cigar connoisseur. Yes, I'll go ahead and admit it. Um, never to excess, just occasionally. But I love cigars. I love culture. This you're looking at here is a Cuban Cohiba. It's the most valued cigar, probably, if you think about it, in all of the cigar world. You know how Forrest Gump said, my mama always said, life is like a bunch of chocolates, a box of chocolates. It's not. Life is like a cigar, because you can get the most expensive cigar, a Cohiba that costs 30 bucks a stick, and you start it, and the first inch tastes like angels and unicorns and, you know, Every cigar, by the time you get down to that last inch, tastes like poop. 
because I don't care how expensive the cigar was starting out, by the time you get to the end, it's all the toxins concentrated and all the burnt taste and everything. Time you get to the end, it's, it's, a, it's bad. Any of you know Clyde Whitworth? He's a friend of mine. He's got some of the most crazy statements. He, he's from Alabama, that explains it. He, I gave him a cigar, he's not a cigar. Oh, sorry, <laughs> didn't know. Didn't know you're so close to Alabama, that makes sense. Um, sorry about Nick Saban though, <laughs> too bad. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It slipped out, the devil made me say it, I'm sorry. I know, I know, that's politics, I'm sorry. Anyway, Clyde said, he's not a cigar smoker, but I gave him one, I said, take this, you'll, you'll be a convert. The next morning he says to me, I said, how'd you like that cigar? He said, Mike, I kept looking for that monkey. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know, the monkey that pooped in my mouth. <laughs> but that's what happens with every cigar by the time you get to the end, and that's what life is like. No matter how healthy you are, by the end of your life, you're not gonna be, you know, you're gonna be breaking down and, and um, so that's the end of our talk, and thank you. <laughs> I, I hope you've been encouraged. That's, that's the lecture. Um, there's a scripture I read a lot. Um, Ecclesiastes is like my favorite book. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember your creator in the days of your youth, because the days of trouble come and the years approach, and you'll say, I find no pleasure in them. It's an interesting insight into aging. It's about the time, the days of trouble, I, I don't think they're talking about physically, Solomon, but it could apply to that, you know? When you get older and you start breaking down physically, but you get better, you get wiser, and you get more spiritual, I think your body breaks down, God made it that way, so you'll start focusing on God. You'll start preparing yourself for being with him in eternity, and that's why our bodies break down and eventually give up, so we can become spirits and we, we can unite with God in spirit, eventually to be physically re resurrected so we look like our old handsome selves. Um, this scripture helps you focus on heaven, and aging makes you reflect and really consider what things are important. So amen to aging. Um, that definitely happened when I got that cancer diagnosis. I had to think about what's important. What am I living, you know, what are the things that are important to live for? Mark 10, 7 and 8, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. The scripture here says, even though we're burning out like a cigar, until the day you die, one of you dies, you're still one flesh. You just happen to have a little more flesh to deal with, but you know, by the time it gets, gets to that point. Um, but you're one flesh until the day one of you passes, and it, it's terrible. I keep hoping Mary and I die together on the plane. Maybe the plane going back from here. I don't know. It'll spare us that misery. I don't want to be alone. She doesn't want to be alone. That's the point. So aging has an impact, but check out these statistics. Individuals with very good health or better are more sexually active than those who are not. By the way, this is a, a study that was done um, uh, on seniors. I, oh, here it is. The New England Journal of Americans did this study on people 60 and older. So this applies to people who are 60 and older. Individuals with very good health or better are more sexually active than those who are not. So stay in good shape for as long as you can. We exercise, we are inveterate exercisers. Um, we, we drive this 70 miles every day to and from work. You know, we have to get up early. We drive, we work all day, and then we have to drive 70 miles back. We drag our sorry butts in late in the day. It is a rare day that we don't drag our sorry butts to do some kind of exercise. You know why? Because, you think this comes easy? <laughs> No, this doesn't come easy. You got to work to do this, work to do this. So, no, the truth is we're scared. We're scared. We're old. We are old. So we're scared of what holds, life holds if we don't keep exercising. So be um, in good health. Older women are less likely to have a sexual partner than compared to men of the same age. Well, that's interesting. Uh, that tells you something about what the nursing home's going to be like when you get there. Just saying. 54% of sexually active people have sex, this is, remember, this is 60 years old and older, 
of sexually active people who have sex at least two or three times a month. So even us old, seems like us old people kind of beat the odds for, you know, the younger ages. 23% of older people have sex at least once a week. Congratulations, you 23 percenters. That's what we're gonna call you. 58% of sexually active people between 57 and 64 have oral sex. I'm not even gonna elaborate on that one. I, that's all I'm going to say about that. 35% of women at this age state that sexual intercourse is not uh, important at all compared to 13% of men. The moral of that story is men don't change. We get older, but we're still men. We basically stay the same. 50% um, of older adults say that they have at least one bothersome sexual issue. And there are plenty of them you can choose from, should you so desire. But half, so if you're one of these older people that has one bothersome sexual issue, and we'll talk about what those might be in a second, give yourself a break. You're, that's, you're one of these 50%. 37% of older men report that maintaining an erection is the biggest cause of their sexual problems. That's quite a big percentage. The male partner's physical health is the biggest reason for not having sex. You should be ashamed of yourselves, brothers. Ashamed. So, your health, what I'm saying, I'm not shaming you. Um, I am encouraging you to watch your health, to take care of yourself. Not because of yourself. Some of us, we could care less, but we have a spouse to please, to honor, to submit to physically and emotionally. So brothers, we gotta get in good health. 38% um, of males and 22% of females never discuss their sexual relationships with their doctors. Now, let me put a qualifier on that. So part of my job is training young physicians. So I work in a medical residency program, so we've got 28 brand new doctors who spend three years becoming family physicians. That's who I teach. That's who I help train. I've asked them, how many of your patients do you talk to about their sexuality without them bringing it up first? I might get one little hand or two, so shame on both sides. They need to ask you, but you need to speak up if something is going on, because there's a lot of reasons for sexual health problems and a lot of them can be handled very well, very easily medically. What are those, Mike? Well, I'll show you. Um, erectile dysfunction, that's why we have so many commercials and so many purple pills. However, ED is often a function of diabetes and obesity, um, not hypertension. So if you watch your diet and your exercise, you keep control of your, manage your diabetes, and you manage your weight, um, chances are you'll deal with your ED problem. Um, arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, and atherosclerosis, which is clogged arteries. That has to do with um, hyper and hypolipidemia. You have to watch your cholesterol, okay? So if you have problems with erectile dysfunction, your doctor should have told you this, not me, but there are things, lifestyle changes you can make to help that. Watching your weight, exercising, watching your diet, watching your cholesterol. Don't take all these on at once or you'll go crazy. If you're like, I gotta fix all those things, pick one you're gonna work on for the next six months. Exercise, that's all I'm gonna, I'll worry about that other stuff later. It'll make it more palatable if you do it that way. Vaginal dryness, there's certainly things you can do about that. Uh, I won't say anything more about that. There's things you can do. <laughs> what I will say about that is, oop, where did it go? Um, <laughs> what I will say about that What's he gonna say about vaginal dryness? Whatever you choose to do about it, don't put in a drawer where the grandchildren can access easily. That's what I meant to say about it. Because we certainly have had grandchildren that said, Nana, what's this? And Nana has had to say, that's nail polish cleaner. And then, and then they'll say, can you put some on me? So once again, choose your hiding places carefully. <laughs> Arthritis and chronic pain, very detrimental to sexual activity. So get treatment for arthritis and chronic pain um, as much as you can. Depression, um, 
causes decrease in libido, right? It's one of the vegetative symptoms of depression. So you might not think they're connected, but they are. So you can get treated for depression as long as some of the medications you take, including some of the antidepressants, can cause sexual problems. Um, the statins, which you use for cholesterol problems, sometimes can cause sexual side effects. The high blood pressure medications, beta blockers and alpha blockers, can cause problems with sexual functioning. Some of the antidepressants, unfortunately the most popular ones, the SSRIs, Prozac, Paxil, Lexa, uh, Lexapro, Zoloft, the reason they're so popular is they have so few side effects. The one side effect that seems to show up a lot is uh, delayed orgasm or decreased libido. So you, there's ways you can offset that. You can cut down your dose or you can add a different medication to offset it, like Wellbutrin. Don't get me started, I'll talk about that all day. Anxiolytics, in other words, anti-anxiety medications, especially the benzodiazepines. Um, stay away, clonopin, Xanax, don't, don't, don't. I've put the fear of God in my medical residence to ever prescribe them because they're so addictive. Um, and anticonvulsants for people with seizure disorders. So I'm just saying, talk to your physician. Talk to your primary care physician. That's what they're there for. Even if they don't solicit the information from you, don't go away saying, oh, I wish I should have talked to them about my erectile dysfunction or my decreased libido. Um, so these are all things that can be done something about. Oh, and booze. Um, you know, uh, it is good at lowering inhibitions, which gets us all into trouble in excess. So I'm saying go ahead, and sometimes it's very celebratory, and it'll loosen you up, but just like Aretha says, just a little bit, okay? <laughs> Too much, you're going to end up falling asleep. All right, Mary. All right, I am going to give you just one or two quick thoughts and then I'm going to stop talking because my ultimate goal in this class is to get through it and still go to heaven. So, <laughs> I'm done. Um, you know, I hope you're hearing again, this, this is, has to be done as a team, whatever it is, aging, medical problems, medication issues. It's not your problem or her problem or his problem. It's our problem, all right? We got to figure out how to work around this together, together. So no blame, no, this is our problem. We're going to figure out how to solve it. Um, let's talk about things that facilitate sex. Regular time together. We talked about this in the communication class. You know, if, if, if you want to get your wife in the mood, have a conversation. Have a conversation about something she's interested in, all right? Or, or about your relationship. That'll do it. That'll do it, all right? That and a nice gift will usually do it. Um, but I mean, this is, this is the... This is the the heart blood of our marriage is time together, time to, to connect with each other together. Again, no TV, no phone, no, no tablets, no computers, no kids. You might have to rent somebody to take the kids, all right? But you've got you to gotta have time together. For most of us, this means that we're going to have to do the very unsexy thing of scheduling it, all right? It doesn't just automatically happen, right? It just doesn't automatically happen. So you may have to go every other Thursday. This is going to be our date night. You know, we used to, we used to um, on Sunday night, we had a meeting for church, you know, family groups or whatever they were called at that time. We had all these little kids. We had to get a babysitter for, for the meeting anyway. So that was our date night. We just paid the babysitter extra, you know, stay another two hours. And we would go out to Applebee's, yes, yeah. we did, you know. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we had time to talk, to spend time with each other, you know, and then we would come home, kids were already bed, in bed, send the babysitter home with an extra $5. You gotta schedule it, all right? So do that if you have to do that. Um, you know, if you're having trouble in this area of sexuality, it's okay to pray about it. You know, God, God knows we do it, all right? He knows. He, he invented it, by the way, yeah. 
So pray about it. It's okay to pray about it. It's okay to get help from other people with this area. Um, Michael's already talked about health and fitness. Um, and the last thing, I'm gonna let Michael do this one, is be creative. You're up. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> this is hard for me. I'm, I'm just gonna say it, so. We're going to talk a little detail here. Um, so, I'm going to use a metaphor, okay? Um, because it'll be easier. Um, I'm going to use a metaphor that comes from a really good website called The Marriage Bed, if you've ever seen it. The Marriage Bed is for Christian couples about sexuality. They um, liken the sexual life of a Christian couple to a playground. Okay, playground, let's think of a playground. What constitutes a playground? First, it's a protected area, okay? You have a fence around the playground or some other dividing line to keep bad things out and good things in. So that means pornography stays out, sinful behavior stays out, you know, temptations, all that stuff stays out. This is a protected area. Now, um, we're also going to keep out any sex act that's dangerous or sinful or otherwise unacceptable to one or the other spouse. Okay, so if one of you says, I don't care what the Bible says, I ain't doing that. Okay, you respect each other, you submit to each other. You know, now you might be able to say, well, you should try it. No, okay, maybe, but you see what I'm saying? So we're going to keep out, we're going to make this as comfortable as possible for both <clears throat> parties. Inside, the playground, there are a number of pieces of equipment. And if you look at each piece of equipment as a different kind of sexual activity, you'll get what I'm talking about. So what you can do is try each of the items on the playground, right? <laughs> now, some of the playground equipment have different characteristics, right? So you're going to try it and, you know, maybe you as a couple, you like the seesaw. The, you know, it's just this gentle up and down kind of thing, if you know what I'm talking about, you know. Some of you might like the more adventurous, you know that spinny thing? Um, they used to be popular when I was a kid, and you get on it, and you run, and then you jump on it, and you go real fast, and you spin until your head spins, and then you vomit. So maybe some of you are more adventurous like that. But if one, says, one of you says, no, I don't do that because it makes me vomit at the end, then you as the respectful spouse have to say, oh, okay. Then there's these, do you remember, I don't know if they even make them anymore, when I was a kid, they had like, um, it was a thick spring in the ground in cement. And then there were animals you could ride on. And they were usually cheerful little, um, like a turtle or a rabbit or a ladybug. And its motion was this snapping back and forth to the point of almost having a concussion, you know? But it was thrilling for you as a little kid because you liked that snapping back and forth, that violent, recumbent um, motion. So you see what I'm saying? It's a metaphor, it's a metaphor. You still got the slide and you still got other things. You still got a shady tree you can sit under and throw gum at something, you know? You see what I'm saying? What I'm saying is, there's, it's up to you as a couple. You try different things. If there's something that makes someone uncomfortable, then you get on the teeter-totter instead of the springy guy, okay? And you can try different things. It's all good. It's all within your marriage. You can try whatever you want. Um, Mary um, is no longer willing to wear um, Lieutenant Uhura uniforms, as I prefer, but, you know, at least she tried it. At least she tried it. And I had to respect, we don't do that anymore. Um, so you see what I'm saying now? Even if you tried something, you can experiment. 
even if you've tried something when you were young and you couldn't or you didn't want to do it, but now you're thinking, you know, we're older now and things are getting a little, you know, stale, so we better try something. You can always come back, circle around to the boingy thing <laughs> or the spinny thing. It's all there for you. In the confines of a good Christian marriage, anything goes sexually as long as it doesn't hurt somebody, offend somebody, or is against somebody's will or constitution. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so, yeah. Moving on, Mary says. Good, good. Thank you. Whew, I got through it. Um, good, please. Thank you, thank you. Oh, I thought that was a slide I was showing the whole time. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about the upside down thing. You might want to not, yeah. Yeah, and this all has pictures of kids. Ew, okay, all right. Last point when it comes to sexual intimacy, how important it is to communicate, communicate. And this is not a taboo subject. You should be able to say anything you want. Now, I'm gonna go off on a little tangent here. I'm gonna go off on two tangents. By the time I'm done, you're gonna say, I think the radiation affected his brain more than what does any of this have to do with sexual intimacy? Let me explain. Um, this is about the importance of communicating with each other. You know, um, Mary and I are old. We don't have time to monkey around with, am I gonna get lucky tonight? I don't, we can't, we, we're too old to have room for doubt. We gotta communicate what and when, right? But we don't have to be quite so clinical about it. Does anyone know what semaphore is? Okay, those of you who have been in the Navy. Semaphore was invented long before the 18th century, but it was used extensively in the, in the 1700s in the Navy, the navies of Britain and France in the Napoleonic Wars. It is a system of two flags, and each position of holding the two flags means a different letter. In doing so, in the days before electronics, one ship could signal another what to do. They adopted this later on, on land, where they had these towers, I forget what they're called, but big versions of this, where the towers were separated between miles, but within eyesight of each other, and they put up these two giant flags so they could transmit messages from node to node over long distances. What does that have to do? I'm getting there. So that's semaphore, that's called semaphore. The next tangent I want to go on has to do with my love of Star Trek. Now, listen, no, no, no. <laughs> Look, some of you are thinking, you're going to come up to me afterwards and say, oh, I'm a Trekkie too. No, you're not. No, you're not. The, my relationship to Star Trek is we're, it's, we're genetically fused. We're, we're one. There is no one who knows more than I do, okay, about the original series. I'm just saying, don't even. Don't even. John Lusk experienced that full force this morning as we got into a talk on Star Trek. And John said, I'm a Trekkie. What's that episode where he didn't even know the title of it? John didn't even know where the antimatter pod is located in the Enterprise. But he... He calls himself a Trekkie? No, no. The greatest day of my life happened just this summer when I met William Shatner. Wow. Now by meet, I mean we spent four seconds separated by plexiglass thing and had our picture taken and I paid big money for it, but I, we communicated. It was, we bonded. If it weren't for God, I am absolutely sure I'd be worshiping Star Trek. And if you looked in my study, you'd say, uh, Mike, I don't know. I think you're a little on the worshipful side now. So I'm, that's a confession. Now, bringing this together. When it comes to having a sexual encounter, Mary and I want to keep it a little mysterious, but we got to be frank so we know what to prepare for. And heaven knows... If she needs, you know, I've seen myself naked in the mirror. If she needs time to prepare, I get it. She's gonna need, she needs to know. She needs to get, drink a gallon of wine, you know. 
pop a Valium or two, whatever it takes. We have to communicate, we have to communicate. So, we've come up with a semaphore. My favorite pajamas are these. All right, look, look, yes, science officer. Look, I was born to wear that. I was born to wear that, okay? I feel most comfortable in that uniform. I would wear that to work if they wouldn't throw me out. That's my clothing right there. You see me in my study with the Enterprise behind me. I have a pair of pajamas that's a Star Trek uniform. Here's the point, semaphore, top and bottom. If sex is not gonna happen, neither of us needs us to happen, I don't want it to happen for whatever reason, that's what I wear. <laughs> because I know for a fact that this will kill any ounce of desire she might have. <laughs> Over the 40 years of our marriage, she has learned to hate Star Trek so much that if I wear that, she might go to bed early without me. And I'm free then to wear my uniform, put on the original series, and I'm fine. If there's a chance, but no one's convinced, if there's a chance, then I will wear the, so the, if you know Star Trek uniform, it's black pants on the bottom, and they're pretty, pretty sexy looking, if you ask me. If there's a chance, I will wear that as my flag and maybe a black tee or a, you know, something. I don't look sexy in anything, but I try. A black tee or something you know, more form-fitting on top. That's a, that's a me fishing using semaphore <laughs> to signal a maybe. If you're interested, I'm interested. <laughs> See? Now. If it's a red alert, this must happen tonight, I don't care what, you know, we have got to, photon torpedoes have got to be shot, <laughs> all phasers on stun, then I don't wear any of that. And that is a clear message to her. I'm not saying you should adopt this system, I'm just saying the importance of communication because we need to know what's gonna happen tonight, or at least we have to take some of the guesswork out of it. So that's just our solution, I, you know. We're not gonna do the thing we used to do in old marriage retreats where, no, you have your homework, wink, wink, let's get you up there early, and you know. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna give you homework for another time, though. Um, these physicians that I train, I'm in charge of their well-being. One of my tasks is to make sure they don't lose their stuff in three years of residency. So I usually do periodically with them a well-being inventory. The categories are different, but what I do is I make four, a four square, and I've changed it for the purpose of marriage. Four squares, communication, roles, intimacy, personal health. We've talked about all of these things today. What you're gonna do for homework with your spouse is sit down, you're gonna make that, so take a picture of it. You're gonna make one of those and you're gonna rate yourself from one to five in each area. Five being the best, one being the least satisfied we are with this. And you got lots of stuff to talk about. Setting an emotional atmosphere, not responding in anger, got a lot of items to talk about in each one. This should take you some time. Come up together with a number, one to five. Now, if not everything is a five, a perfect five, you got some work to do using some of the things we've talked about today. But once again, don't, don't try to kill the whole buffalo in one, that's a bad analogy. Don't try to tackle the whole thing at once. Pick one of these areas, if, you know, if they're all ones, that's fine. Just pick one to work on for the next few months, okay? And you're gonna work on that one thing. That's part of setting SMART goals that are specific, measurable. This, we use these for um, patients with obesity and diabetes. So you wanna make sure your goals are specific. This is exactly what we're gonna accomplish. Measurable, which might mean how has our frequency gone up? 
achievable, like, you know, a not achievable goal is I'm going to be, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger in the bedroom or I don't know. I can't think of a good example. So, you know, that's impossible, you, you know. So pick an achievable goal, a realistic goal, and make it timely. In other words, you put a kind of a timeline on it. We're going to get better at this within a certain amount of time. That keeps it from being open-ended and keeps you from putting it off until next year and next year and next year. So if you're not all fives, whoops, I went backwards again. If you're not all fives in each of those areas, pick one that you're going to work on. And then the beauty of it is um, you can then go back and, let me get there. I keep pressing the wrong button, I'm sorry. Na -na -na, na -na -na. Just a reminder. <laughs> All right, never mind. If it's not perfect, you're gonna, you can re-administer this periodically, maybe twice a year, okay? So, or you know, once every few months, you're gonna do it again and say, well, we, we progressed um, in this area. Now we're gonna tackle the next area. Now, here's our personal information. We ask only that you use it very sparingly, okay? This is for, you know, because we love you guys and we're willing to help, but don't remember we get paid to do this stuff and you know we love you guys, but um, you know don't call us with all your sexual problems and stuff like that. But huh? Yeah, call the lust once again. <laughs> open 24 hours, willing to help. They told us this. They said it doesn't matter if it's sexuality, anything. They are they are ready to help you. Thank you so much for being appreciative and attentive, and we really love you, and we hope you ask us back sometime. Thank you.